Hi everyone, Dom Femulara here, and I am so excited to continue this series of Mapex Live. This is so exciting. We do it at the same time, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So wherever you are around the world, I ask you to join us, come on. And my guest today is Steve Fiddick. Steve, thank you so much for joining me. Dom, thanks so much for having me on. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you and, and have an opportunity to share my life experiences and my musical experiences with the Mapex family. It's so great, Steve. You know, Mapex gives us this opportunity to, to to reach the world, you know, through this wonderful format. And then, of course, these recordings stay on social media, on the Facebook social media, and then they're put on the uh, uh, Mapex YouTube channel. So send all your students or anyone that you know that couldn't see it now. We'll fun funnel them all until later on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Steve, I always say, I've known you for many, many years. I've heard you play. I, you are like what I call one of these unsung heroes. You are out there driving and pushing the wave forward like this huge tsunami that you might not be a household name in the drumming world, but you really are a very important force in what we're doing. So this, I'm glad you joined us here. Well, no, I, I appreciate that very much, Don. Uh, it really means it really means a lot. Uh, coming from you and, um, you know, as you mentioned, I, I'm not a household name, but uh, that wasn't really the reason that I that I got into playing music. I. I got into playing music for the sheer love of playing yeah. and I have a burning desire in my belly to constantly progress. So I'm, I'm, I'm a student of the instrument. So I'm always trying to find new ways, new techniques, new approaches um, to understand the music better, to serve the musicians that I'm playing with yeah. on a higher level um, and do it in an efficient way so that, um, I continue to be uh, a value to uh, the musicians I work with. Well, listen, you do that well. Not only the musicians they work with, but all the students and people that you influence in the educational field also, which which is vast in who you reach. You know, I, I have done here jazz drummer, composer, author, educator. You now started your own record label. I mean, you're wearing a lot of different hats in this industry, which are extremely important qualities to have in today's world in the music industry. Well, drummers by nature and jazz musicians by, by nature are resourceful people, I yeah. find. Yeah. So um, it's, it's very, very hard in the economy that we find ourselves in mm. to make a living doing one thing. So uh, from a very young age, some of my first teachers uh, imparted that information. The more quivers, uh, the, more ar the more arrows I have, excuse me, in my quiver, yeah. uh, the more e the easier it will be for me to perhaps have a um, a fruitful career as mm -hmm. a musician, you know, yeah. as, as a musician, and and that's that was really always my goal. My goal was always to play music with older musicians. My my father was a um, a tenor saxophonist. Oh, he, he was a, he was a tool and a tool and die machinist by trade. He worked at Topps Chewing Gum in Duryea, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. I'm from just outside of uh, Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, nice. Northeastern PA. And um, so he, you know, he worked on the machines that cut the baseball cards and wrap the ring pops and the bazooka bubble gum. But on weekends, he played tenor saxophone and a little bit of guitar and a little bit of violin. And um, so he would always go out and play gigs on weekends. And when I was really, really young, he was playing five, six nights a week with his band. Mm -hmm. And he always would have rehearsals with the musicians at our house. So from the time I was like, two, for, as, as long as I can remember, he would have these musicians over and they were all blue collar guys because that, that, that part of the yeah. world is just so blue collar. I mean, my grandfather was a coal miner. Both of my grandfathers were coal miners. So, um, you know, very hard working stock, you know, that's, that's where I come from. And so all of these guys worked in factories, but when they got together to play music, they were so passionate about it. And that's really what, that's really what stuck with me because all of these guys would get together, they would put on a record, they couldn't read music. They would yeah. just listen to the record over and over and over again, try to figure out their parts and they were collaborating long before I even knew what that word meant, they were collaborating, <laughs> trying to figure out how to play this tune and um what kind of music were they playing at, the, at that time well you know one of my my father's favorite groups that he really dug was the bill black combo now bill black was the bassist with 
Elvis in the 50s with the very first group that Elvis had at, at Sun Records. And so when Elvis went in the army, Bill started recording under his own name. And they were instrumental tunes. They were all instrumental tunes. And they were done at Royal Recording yeah. in Memphis. And that's where Al Green recorded. Yeah. Um, so so many great, so many greats recorded there in Royal Recording Studios. And it's still there in Memphis. And um, so they they were playing a lot of that kind of music. They were instrumental tunes. They didn't have a they didn't have a vocalist and uh, a lot of shuffles. You know, a lot of rhythm and blues type shuffles. And uh, some of my earliest memories behind a set of drums was playing with my father. He was on tenor. I was behind the drums and I was just trying to figure out the beat that was happening on the recording. <laughs> and, and we played together and it was it was just for the love of it. it. There wasn't any analysis, you know, there wasn't like, wow, what's my right hand doing against my left hand? There wasn't any thought of coordination. It was just I was just trying to mirror and and mimic what i was hearing and and my dad was a stickler for two things time right he said if you're not playing in time steve the dancers aren't going to dance <laughs> so make sure that you're keeping that beat really really steady and the second thing was he was huge on education so he uh he wanted me to go study at a very young age so that i can learn how to read because that was a skill that the musicians he worked with and himself, he didn't have that skill. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to have, uh, he wanted all of his children to be musicians and, and learn to read and go on and have a, a career in music. I was the only one that followed suit. I had three other, three other siblings, but I was the oldest son. And so, um, you know, a lot of my father's traits really, really rubbed off. But he, he would say to me, son, you play music for people. You know, you play music for people to help them forget the troubles of everyday life. That's a similar thing that R. Blakey said, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, long before I knew anything about jazz, anything about rock, anything about anything, I just, I just ca captured the vibrations of my father's band hanging out, being together, laughing, cutting up, playing music, trying to figure it out. And then eventually, he started taking me out on gigs. My dad, so um, I would sit on his saxophone case for four hours at this wedding reception or bar mitzvah or anniversary party. And then at the end of the night, he would let me play one tune with the band. So, and it was like music of the day, like songs of the seventies. That's kind of what I was raised. So I was like, you know, it could have been like wipe out or it could have been, you know, stuck in the middle with you by Steeler's wheel or, you know, something by Casey and the sunshine band or Bill Withers. These were all 45s that I owned and I just yeah. tried to play along with them. But he would give me an opportunity to play like one tune at the end of the night. And then it became two tunes and it became three tunes and so on. Mm -hmm. Until finally, I started subbing for my dad's drummer in his band. And um, I started playing with bands in Northeastern PA when I was 11 years old and, and helped pave the way and pay for my tuition when I went on to uh, music school. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was a great experience. But again, it was just it was. It was it was like um, it was like a club. It was like a bunch of guys that just wanted to be together. It was like a extended family for me, playing with my friends, musicians that were older, learning from musicians that were older. They were always so uh, willing to give uh, of their time uh, to try to shape and mold um, a youngster like myself. And, and well, that's 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 it's really fantastic. And you you mentioned first of all you mentioned you owned 45s. There's probably a large majority of people out there who have no idea what the hell we're talking about. And a 45 was just a, a smaller little record that needed a little larger disc to play on our turntable inside it. And it had one song on each side as opposed to an LP that had many, many songs on a larger disc. And yeah. like yourself, that's what we purchased at that time. And we listened to these 45s and we listened to it and learned from it. So that's a, a powerful memory going back many, many years. Yeah, actually, you know, um, my father passed in 2017, and uh, when I was cleaning out, cleaning out uh, the family home, I, I found all those old records that we used to play to, wow. and he had them in a special place in the house. Wow! Which, like, you know, it just, you know, I could cry right now thinking about it. Yeah, sure. Get sure. very emotional because I mean, I, I really, uh, without him, no me. 
you know, listen, this this is the, the, the powerful legacy that you leave your parents understood. And I'm sure both of your parents were very, very proud of what you were able to accomplish and what you're continuing to do, Steve. This is so powerful. I mean, even on this call right now, we've got I've got people from this is this is so huge. I've got um Maxim Dioman from the Ukraine. Whoa. I've got Steve Preston here. I've got uh, Dorman Gomez from Guatemala. I've got people from Nashville, Manuel Cortez is from Mexico. Beautiful. We've got Beautiful. Ralph Peterson Jr. has joined Ralph. us. Talk about a legend, family, a legend right there. One of my teachers. I'm, I'm going to have him soon in a couple of weeks here. So everybody tune in. We've got uh, we've got Brandon Koo from Singapore. So hmm. the reach of your uh, of even your emotion talking about your dad and your parents, this is what they need to hear. The fact that this is kind of where this whole came from. Talk about now some of the teachers that you had when you started moving on, because we share several teachers that we we experienced together. Well, I want to I want to give a quick shout out to Ralph. Yeah. Um, since he, since he's on, and he was such a major influence um, on my life musically. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, early to mid '90s, and I was uh, you know fairly new in the military, fairly new in the Army band here in D.C. And um, in most of my lessons, all of my lessons leading up to uh, my lessons with Ralph when he was living here in D.C. at the time uh, were you know very. Uh, drum specific, you know, there would be lessons where we would sit down on a drum pad, we work on our hand motion and our technique, then we would go behind the drums and we would work on our coordination. And all of that is extremely, extremely important. Yeah. But with Ralph, we did we did lessons at a club in, in Washington called HR 57, which is, you know, this great place where, you know, the music would live and he would have a jam session there. And I met him at one of those jam sessions that he was was hosting and he let all these great drummers come up and play so he gave opportunities for youngsters yeah. youngsters like myself to come up and play and i asked him for lessons so the next day he got together with me and we had a lesson at the club and the whole lesson the, the first thing was he pulled out a trumpet and he started playing trumpet and he said well <laughs> why, don't, why don't you call a tune and, and we'll play together and that was like the first time ever that i had a lesson where it was we were playing duets, mm. trumpet and drums, and we were playing tunes and we were talking about improvisation and accompaniment and what my rhythms were meaning to him as, you know, as a player that played with such a linear approach and, and played cross rhythms and played polyrhythms on the trumpet. Yeah, he played he played the trumpet like he plays the drums. It's an <laughs> extension of his personality. Absolutely. So it was just such a heavy life altering like change in terms of my concept hmm. and um you know the guy's a warrior man and, oh. and i'm just so honored that he's on here checking and this out because uh he really changed the trajectory of the way i think about playing the drums absolutely and he's so still, thank you ralph thank you he's still doing it you know like the warrior as you said that he is and i was just with him last year in in birmingham england and he just you know wowed the crowd with his philosophy and his playing at such a high level so well i'm going to have him on soon in a couple of weeks and we'll have him here also so it'll be a great a great fun there too so so who else did you have as far as teachers well my first drum teacher in uh, my hometown outside of wilkesbury was angelo stellar right and he um he was friends with buddy hmm. you know he was an old school big band drummer he studied with ted reed and um you know he taught the fundamentals he taught you how to read he taught you your rudiments, uh, the 13 essential and the 26 standard. Um, he taught beats, he played piano. So whenever he would show uh, a student a specific beat, whether it was a foxtrot or swing in four or, or a polka beat or any kind of groove, yeah. he would play piano along with you. So there was always that element of accompaniment that the drums are an accompaniment instrument first and foremost. They're about the groove, trying to make everyone else on the bandstand sound and feel complete, you know. Yeah. Uh, so he, he, you know, he was my first teacher. And then when I was uh, in high school and into college, uh, I studied percussion with Robert Novak. And uh, he taught yeah. at uh, Wilkes University, where yeah. I attended, which was a yeah. small liberal arts school in my hometown. Um, you know, it's just so different, at least for me and my experience, you know, it's all about environment and, you know, being from a small town, I never really even considered like applying out of state or, or anything. I just figured, well, I'm, I'm in this, I'm in Wilkesbury and the best music program in my hometown is, 
is Wilkes University. So I'm going to go there. And but I had some really great teachers that that taught at that school. Robert Novak was one of them. He put me through a lot of uh, snare drum reading books like Podemski. And, yeah, yeah. The uh, thing is, the yeah. Tyrone book and the, the Fred Albright book. And, yeah. uh, you know, he really got my snare drum reading together. And and Bob Wilbur was running the jazz ensemble when I was in high school. Oh, wow. And Bob Wilbur wrote the soundtrack for the Cotton Club. Yeah. And uh, he he studied with Sidney Bechet on soprano. Wow. So he was like he just passed, I think, a year or so ago. So he was running the jazz program at at, at Wilkes or running the jazz band. There really wasn't a, a jazz program per se. And then after he left, Tom Hines took it over. And, and but the point is, uh, all of these gentlemen at this school gave me lots of opportunities to play. Yeah. You know, I was playing in wind ensemble. I was playing in orchestra. I was playing in the jazz ensemble. I was playing in percussion ensemble. You know, my, my school day started at eight o'clock with classes. Classes ended at around three o'clock. And I was in ensembles from three o'clock to nine o'clock every day. So I was, oh, I was gigging on weekends. So, <laughs> um, but we didn't have a drum set teacher at, at Wilkes where I went. So in 86, when I was a freshman, I went to my first percussive art society convention. So Robert Novak, he said, you guys got to go. You got to check out PAS. It's in DC. It's in Washington. You need to go get in your car and get down to the percussive art society international convention. Nexus was there. Steve Gadd was there. What Jack year was DeJanette that? Jeanette was there. What year was that? Can you remember what year that was? 1986. 1986. They got to remember PAS. It's percussive art society. The website is PAS.org, PAS.org. And they've been around for well over 55 years and what they're yeah. doing. So it was great that you got there in some of the earlier, earlier sessions. Yeah. So, I'm, I mean, I went to this convention and I was surrounded thousands of percussionists. Yeah. Uh, you know, every industry person was there. All the drum companies and percussion companies were there on display. And I was able to interface with all of these drummers and percussionists. I was able to go up to them and, and ask for their autograph or talk to them. And one of the drummers I met at that convention was Ed Soph. And Ed Sof was giving a clinic, and he guested with the Army Blues, uh, the Army Blues Jazz Ensemble. So, um, and I, you know, fast forward, you know, ten years. Fast forward to 1996 when I auditioned for that band and became a member of that band, the Army Blues. Yeah. Well, that was the first time I heard that group, and the first time I met Ed Sof. He was very gracious. He gave me his business card at the Yamaha booth. And he said, yeah, if you want to take lessons, give me a call. He was living in New Haven, Connecticut at the time, right? teaching up there. And uh, he was also teaching at uh, University of Bridgeport. And uh, Joel Rosenblatt was studying with him there. Weckl yeah. studied with him there. Yeah. Um, and so I started studying with Ed. It was like a five and a half hour drive from my home. So I drove from Wilkes-Barre up to New Haven, took a two hour lesson, and then drove home. So I did that for about a summer and into the fall. And then he got the job at the University of North Texas. He accepted the job at University of North Texas and he started there in the fall of 87. And he, and he said to me, well, Steve, well, who are you gonna study with? You know, and, and I was just not aware, man. I was just not aware of anything <laughs> at all. Like I was totally, it's not like kids today, man. I sound like an old fogey. It's not like kids today where you know, everyone is so informed and they know so much because of social media and the ability of checking out YouTube. I mean, I, I just didn't know anything. I didn't really even know how to answer. Him. My but first you know, lesson with Ed, he said, well, you know, I, I came in with a, a suitcase full of method books. <laughs> you know, like every method book I ever went through, I, I came in with, you know, bolt shaping books, everything. I mean, I came in with all this stuff. Man. <laughs> and, and Ed said, well, man, you've been through all this stuff. This is really, really impressive. Why don't you sit down behind the drums and play? And I froze. Uh, I was like, what play? What, do you want to you hear a beat? He goes, <laughs> ah, I, I want to hear you play. Whatever, you know, play some, improvise. I couldn't do it because I had such a method book intensive, yeah. you know, background where every week I'm going for my lesson and I would take the next page out of the book. And I'm not downplaying that. I think that's really, 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 really important. Especially yeah. if you're working on your fundamentals like reading. Absolutely. It's really important to do that. It's really There's important a balance. to have that experience. It gets There's a balance, confident. yeah. But where it comes to playing jazz, I mean, there is really no method book that's going to provide you with the tools 
to express yourself musically in the moment. Yeah. And that just comes from doing, you know, you learn by doing. And, um, and so I, I really didn't really know how to answer him or, or, or play. And so we broke it down and he helped me with my balance on the instrument. He helped me with molar. He was the first person to, to uh, expose me to the molar technique through his book, Essential, Essential Techniques. Um, and um, Essential Techniques for Drum Set. And, uh, you know, but when he was moving to North Texas, when he was going to Denton, he said, well, who are you going to go study with? Again, no idea. Hmm. Um, I was just so dependent. I was so damn needy, Dom. <laughs> you know, and he said, you should go study with Joe Morello. You know, I think he can help you. And and uh, and he was right. You know, I, I, I guess because I have such a respect for elders. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I think of myself as a disciplined person. Um, so what was it like after Ed? After Ed, you, then, then you went on to, to, to came out to, to New York? Yes. Yeah, so, so I started studying with Joe. Yeah. Started with studying with Joe in November of 87. Joe Morello, and, yeah. Yeah. My, and and my parents where, took me where, the where first were those where were those lessons? Those were in um, in West Orange, New Jersey. Was that at a Glenn a, Weber's drum shop? Glenn Weber's drum shop. Glenn Weber, another fine, fine percussionist and drum set player who had a school. That's uh, the uh, where Joe taught later on in his life. Fantastic. Yeah. So he Joe started studying there. I think I started teaching there. Excuse me, in the mid eighties. Yeah. Um, and so I, I I took my first lesson in November of eighty seven. And the lesson was slated for five to seven because I took a two hour lesson. So it was a five o'clock lesson. So I got there early, you know, so I always tell my students to be early is to be on time. To be on time is to be late. So please don't be late. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so I got there at 430. My parents, you know, five o'clock rolls around. Joe's not there. Five thirty. Joe's not there. <laughs> Six o'clock. Joe's not there. And uh, so I turned to Glenn and, and his son was working behind the counter. I said, what's you know, what's going on? You know, is Joe going to show up? And, and they're like, this is completely normal for Joe, like to be late for lessons. So, but let me call him since this is your first lesson with him. Let me call him. But you should always call Joe before you take a lesson just to make sure he's feeling good to come in. I said, okay, lesson learned. I'll make sure I do that the next time. Um, but anyway, they called Joe at, at his apartment in Irvington. And um, sure enough, you know, he was just getting ready to come over and he got there at seven o'clock. <laughs> the lesson was supposed to be five to seven. It, it turned out to be seven to nine. And uh, so after that, I, I just started driving myself to lessons. And I would either pick him up and we would go have a late lunch or early dinner, then have the lesson. Or I would be his last lesson. And then I would take him out afterwards for dinner. Yeah. And so a two-hour lesson would turn into around five to seven hours of yeah. being together. Yeah. It and, and, and that was really important because... We talked about the fundamentals. We talked about the hand motion and his experience with George Lawrence Stone and Billy Gladstone and uh, how he wanted to study with Moeller, but Moeller wouldn't accept him as a student. Um, playing on the instrument, balance, dynamic balance, coordination, improvisation, playing over tunes, um, all of that. But it was, it was that time spent with him at a restaurant where you learn how he interpreted everything. He interpreted people. He would, he would, he just had a certain way, as you know, I'm preaching to the choir, Dom, because you studied with him for a long time. Yeah. But for our listeners, he just had a way of getting the best out of people, whether it was his waiter or the bartender or whoever. He just had a way about him and he never raised his voice. He was very, very kind, gentle, yeah. soft spoken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, very much so, very much so. And, and you know, it's amazing because he, he ended up, from what I understand, he had uh, one lesson with Moeller. And uh, he had one lesson with Moeller. And then, um, you know, to schedule him back again, Moeller had many of the students that felt they should have the technique better because Joe already kind of had the technique in his hands. Yeah. He already yeah. had the whip motion. So it was really kind of interesting to see how, how uh, those three guys, Gladstone, Stone, and Moeller, were the three names that I wanted to research. In the course of time, that's why I ended up going to Morello because he was the best student of George Lawrence Stone. The fact that you had those lessons, how, how long did you study with Joe? Well, I would take a two a two hour lesson every two weeks for four years. Wow, beautiful. And then I joined the military. Well, then I went to North Texas. Right. So I started my master's at University of North Texas, and um, I was a teaching assistant there in the percussion department. I wasn't in the jazz area. I was in the percussion right. department. So. 
Um, I was assisting a percussion methods class and I was teaching freshman snare drummers. So I was doing a lot of teaching, but I wasn't really doing a lot of playing. So it just, it really wasn't a good fit for me. There were 150 percussion majors at the time at mm -hmm. North Texas. Yeah. And I was coming from a school where at Wilkes, where there were like eight, there were eight students in my graduating class in, yeah. my music, in the music department. So it was very, very small. The, the teacher student ratio was very, very small. So, it, you know, I just felt like I was, um, I just felt really lost at, at the program at North Texas. It just wasn't a good fit for me. Yeah. But at the time, there were so many incredible drummers there. Like uh, uh, Jim Riley was there and, uh, you know, Ari Honig came shortly after. And uh, oh, just so many, so many. Uh, Keith Carlock was there. I mean, there's so many yeah. great drummers. I was like, Jim White. I was like, whoa, it's <laughs> like amazing. Like every t everywhere I turned. So when did you Jason, join? Jason Sutter. I mean, all these cats were there and they were all my friends. They were all really great people. Um, but I just, I just couldn't, fit, I don't know. I just couldn't fit in. I was always sort of like, I don't know. I just, I just never really, it was kind of like Matt Chamberlain. I think he maybe studied there for a while. Yeah. And he, I think he had a similar experience where it just didn't feel like, uh, I mean, it felt more institutional, I guess, because it had to be, because it was so big. It had, you had to fit in certain lanes. Yeah. I didn't even know what that meant. I still really don't know what that means because nope. You know, everybody has a certain way that they learn. And that was so cool about Ed and Joe was that, you know, a collection of method books. Ed, Peter Erskine said this to me one time, a collection of method books and education does not make. So it's about the student and how you can figure out methods and approaches to help that that student. But with 150 students, how do you do it without, you know, a, a real strict and stringent curriculum? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. Let me ask this question. So, so when did you start the army band? Um, I joined, <laughs> it's a good funny story. Um, I was at North Texas. There was a posting about this band at uh, Fort Meade, Maryland, which is one of the premier bands in, in, in the DC area. Yeah. And um, U.S. Army Field Band. Back in 67, that was the band that Steve Gadd was in. Right. He was in that unit. And uh and so, like, I wanted to play drum set, so I saw this opening, and I said, well, what the hell? I don't have anything to lose, so I'll send a recording. I'll, I'll prepare a recording. I'll practice, prepare a recording, and send it. You know, um, I'm wiser, and I'll end up coming out the other end, a better player through the experience of preparation. So I sent it in, and I was invited for an audition. They paid for my way to D.C. I came up there, started, uh, did the audition, came back to, to Denton, and uh, they offered me the position. So I went to basic training on January 17th, 1991. And so, um, and that was right at the height of the first Gulf War. Mm. So the first Gulf War, the bombing started on January 16th. Now, I'm not talking about bombs with a big band. I'm talking about bombs <laughs> in Iraq. That's a whole nother thing. <laughs> For sure. well, we'll get to big band, hopefully. But <laughs> man, so the next morning, I'm I, the recruiter picks me up in my house in Wilkesbury, and we go off to, um, you know, I go off to basic training at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, the mm. home of the field artillery. And so this is the first full day of the Gulf War, and uh, my drill sergeants, the eight weeks I was there, the drill sergeants had me convinced, son, you're not going to uh, play in the band when you get out of basic training. You're going to Iraq. So I was like scared, you know what? Yeah. Because I just wanted to play. I just wanted to play music, you know. And and my father always taught me: if an opportunity comes, take it, or or at least try out for it. And you can, if you get the position, you can always refuse it, but never pass down an opportunity because that can also change the trajectory trajectory in your life. Yeah. And so, and my father was a, a veteran. My father was a you know, he, he fought in the Battle of Pork Chop Hill in the Korean War, wow. which I didn't know. I didn't know until four months before he passed. Wow. And he shared that with me. So, you know, I mean, being blue collar and, and being raised in that environment where, you know, if an opportunity comes your way, man, seize it and make that situation better than it was when you found it. And that's kind of how I... Um, how I was raised. And so I took it where a lot of my friends at North Texas at the time were like, you're going to do what you're going to join. I said, yeah. well, it's a, it's a gig, you know, it's a gig. I get to play with good players. It was a five piece show band that I joined. It was called the volunteers five piece show band. It was the first experience I had playing with loops and sequences, 
playing with click tracks in a live setting, playing with recording with click tracks. Um, it was a it was a it was a versatile band, a flexible band because. Uh, the horn player and the piano player played a uh, trumpet and trombone. So we played standards, we played pop tunes, we played show music, we played medleys. Um, so, I mean, it, it all comes out in the wash in the end, you know? I mean, every experience, every life experience that you have, um, every performing experience that you have, it's, it's just, that's what you play. Yeah. You know, that, when well, you play, that's what you're playing. So remember, and now, but I want everyone to understand that the army band, wasn't just marching in parades. This was you were playing tunes and you yeah. were stationed and you had to perform for different people. So it was a pretty, pretty active road gig. Yeah. So at that time, that band was traveling 120 days a year on the road. Yeah, that's serious. So we were out 120 days. Uh, the, the, the mission of the Army Field Band is to take yeah. the music to the grassroots of America and beyond. That was sort of the, the mantra of yeah. the Army Field Band. It still probably is. But, uh, you know, a lot of guys in the Vietnam era were, were coming down right out of college to audition because they wanted to stay stateside and play with a great band. And um, when I met Steve Gadd um, at the Four Seasons Hotel after a gig uh, that he had with uh, James Taylor, and I met him in the lobby, I was talking to him, no, excuse me, Eric Clapton. And I met him in the lobby, all he wanted to talk about was his friends in the Army Field Band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's he all I wanted to talk about. It was like his Army buddies, what are they doing? now? You know, I was born in 68, so he was in, he was serving with guys that I didn't know, yeah, but I yeah. knew a few of their names. But, you know, I mean, Steve Gadd, I mean, he he did it. So I figured, well, man, if it's, if Steve Gadd was open to that, <laughs> why, you know, who am I to not be open to that? And I'm so glad I did it because it was a drum set gig. The only marching I did the first five years I was in the army band was President Clinton's first inaugural parade. Yeah. So I was involved in seven presidential inaugurations all the way up to the last president's inauguration, President Trump. So, um, you know, it was a good experience for me. It's not for everyone, but for me, I was able to play with musicians of a very high caliber. It's where I learned to uh, arrange music. It was where I learned to compose music. I could, we had a built-in network of of writers right there in the band. If I had a question about a chord substitution, I could talk to, you know, this musician or that musician. If I had a, a question about a spelling or counterpoint, I can talk to these musicians about right. that. So it was always, you know, trial and error, but also worked with really great guest artists like Clark Terry, Bill Watrous, Phil Wilson, Wynton Marsalis, Doc Severinsen, Herbie Hancock. So you learn because you had two rehearsals and one of them is with a guest artist, so you had to learn their music really quickly. So you learn how to be very efficient quickly. You know, you learn how to be efficient with the music and your musical choices. So for me, it was a good experience. That's a real wide variety of artists that you're backing up. I mean, listen, the intensity of what you learned. So when did when did Chapin come into the, into the picture? Was that later on or at that well, time? With, with Jim, I never formally studied with Jim, but I, I had Jim in for a clinic presentation. I was running um, a drum set symposium at the University of Maryland where I taught mm -hmm. for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I taught there part time while I was on active duty. And I started this drum set symposium, which later morphed into a percussion camp. Right. That's another story. But um, so I would have three drummers come in every summer and they would do clinics in the afternoon. And then some of them would guest with the Army Blues at night for a free concert. So I had Danny Gottlieb, John Riley, Joe Morello one summer. The next summer I had um, I had Jim Chapin, Ed Sof, and Ralph Peterson. Beautiful. Uh, the next summer I had Roy Haynes, Dennis Chambers, and I think, oh, and Sean Pelton. Oh, so I mean, it was like a real eclectic thing. And we had like an hour clinic. Kids can interface. Community members can interface. It was just a way of bringing you know, a sense of awareness to the community at large, um, yeah, using the drum as sort of the focal point. But here you were organizing, you're organizing these events too and putting this all together. So, I mean, you were a, you know, a, a mover and shaker at many levels at that time. Yeah. So I was, I was doing that at that point and, uh, that's kind of how I met Jim and, and Jim came in and he did this great clinic and he's just, I never met him before. I was actually nervous to meet him because, you know, it's just the way he carried himself. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's like when Miles Davis talked about how he can see a musician the way they would hold the horn, 
you know, just the stature and the way they hold the horn, he could tell whether or not they could play. Jim had that way about him, you know. I mean, you, you were just best friends with him, and, and he loved you so much. He always talked about you. He always talked about you, Don. That's nice. And, um, and so he, you know, he did his clinic, and, uh, you know, I said, I said, you know, man, if you would want to come back, I could probably line up some students for you. And he goes, well, you know, I could stay at your house tonight. And if you line up students tomorrow, we could do it. We could do it tomorrow. And I said, really? And so he came over and in this very room, he must have he must have came down here maybe four or five different times. Beautiful. And he would spend you know, he would spend the night. He would spend a few nights here at the house. I would line up a day's worth of teaching. Um, one time I went to hear, he took me to hear his, uh, the Chapin family band play yes, with play Tom with and, and his Absolutely. granddaughter and, and, and he would come out and he would play a drum solo. You're so proud. He was one of the most this, proud men I've ever met. This is James Harrison makes a comment. James is a phenomenal drummer. Yeah. Uh, James the if you ever saw Chapin walking around with a pad sticks and you stopped them, you got a lesson. So there were many, many times, that, point well taken, James, really, really great. It really was like that. Sure, I've, got a, I've got a pad i got to share with you. This is a pad. This is the pad that he had at this clinic that he gave me. And he gave me this pad. Now, he probably said this to a lot of drummers, but he signed it, and he said, let's see. He said, to Steve, the man with the best hands, Jim uh, Chapin. Uh, he, uh, he, probably, he probably signed the pads like this to just about everyone. I don't know, man. Jim, Jim was pretty Jim was pretty impressive. Somebody put some serious time into their hands and what they did. So let's let's go to this point now. So now talk about now the the um what you're doing now. You got your artistic director at the Naptown Jazz Kigs in Maryland for, for the Jazz Kids in Maryland. You uh, you're an artist in, in, in residence at Temple University in PA, right? Right, in Philly, North Philly. In North Philly. Educational, oh, wow. educational consultant at Jazz at Lincoln Center, which is the essentially Ellington program, which is an incredible program, and the master lecturer at the University of Arts, uh, also in Philly, Pennsylvania. So t tell me about, about th that kind of a responsibility now. Well, so, you know, teaching for me, right, it's a shared experience, like we, we, we talked about a few minutes ago, where, sure. you know, I'm trying to share the experiences that I had with the great teachers that I've had. And I've had so many. I mentioned Ralph. I mentioned Ed Sof. I mentioned Joe Morello. John Riley was was pivotal, you know, in terms of yeah. interpreting big band charts and 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 learning the history and the great recordings and, and exposing me to transcribing um, really helped me as I was uh, getting ready to audition for the army blues big band because i really didn't have them that, that much big band experience at the time yeah um you know just so many great teachers um and so i try to share that experience that i've had so i, I feel like i'm a conduit f for my students at temple mm. at university of the arts i'm back also at University of Maryland part-time. So yeah. I try to share, I, I try to act as a conduit to share those experiences that I've had with those great teachers because some of them are no longer with us. Um, but I pepper it with my own playing and my own performance point of view, which, you know, is primarily big band because, I mean, I spent 21 years with a big band. So I'm sort of siloed as a big band drummer. So m most people think, wow, he's a big band drummer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's nice to have some kind of identity. Music, yeah, totally. But, but I mean, I also like funk and I like rock and I like seventies rock and roll and I like stacks and I like the Beatles and I like <laughs> all of it. So, um, but if I can help someone through my teaching, whether it's privately one-on-one -on -one, uh, at the university level, I also like working with, jazz ensembles because I've had so much experience in the big band and working with these guest artists that I mentioned, you know, they have a way when they stand in front of a band, when you have John Clayton standing in front of a band, you can't help but learn how that person, John, works with a big band or yeah. the way Doc Severinsen works with the big band. I mean, he, Doc Severinsen came out, came from behind the drum riser when we played with him and he put, he put, put his foot down on the drum riser and he looked at me and he said, it's you and me, kid, let's go. <laughs> and then he stood in front of the band and he counted the tunes off and we were off and running. And um, so well, you, learning, you're, from, you're learning from those great, those great musicians that would stand in front of the band and rehearse the big band. Yeah. I take those experiences and I try to pass them on when to students through Naptown jazz kids. Now Naptown jazz kids, um, 
you know, is this program that I began with some colleagues of mine here in the Annapolis area where I live, you know, to help enhance and broaden, you know, jazz to the, to the greater community here in Annapolis to try to share this improvisational music, America's true art form with middle schoolers, with elementary schoolers, with high schoolers, so that they can learn how to be resilient. Right. They're not all going to go on and become jazz musicians. I mean, that's yeah. that's foolish to think that that's going to happen. Yeah. However, if they can become resourceful and they can have an improvisational mindset to what they do in life, mm. no one saw this pandemic coming. Yeah. Right. No one. But most jazz musicians are resourceful. Drummers are resourceful. So we figure out new pathways. We figure out new ways to express ourselves mm. because we're improvisational people. Yeah. So like that drum set symposium that I started back in the early aughts, in the early 2000s, that's what I'm doing with Naptown Jazz Kids to try to help right. younger generations using the mouthpiece of, of America's true art form jazz as an improvisational tool. Nice. Um, and essentially Ellington, as you mentioned, I mean, with Marsalis, it doesn't get much better than that. Absolutely. He's one of the most articulate uh, human beings I've ever been around. As a player um, and as a speaker and as yeah. an artist, he is he's a motivator. He, oh. he comes to the chase. Um, he holds you accountable. Yeah. He wants to hear what you have to say. If he agrees with you or not, he wants to hear what you have to say. And if you're not speaking up, he doesn't really uh, have much respect for that. Mm -hmm. So he surrounds himself with, uh, with the best uh, faculty to work with kids because we, again, are we are the bridge, uh, so to speak, uh, for his program, and it's in their 25th year. Wow. And to date, that program has distributed 245,000 arrangements to over 6,600 schools in 55 countries, Dom. That's incredible. That's incredible. Free. That's incredible. That's Free. incredible. Incredible. Free resource. Okay. Right? So please and, check and out academy.jazz.org slash ee for more information on that wonderful program say that again that website it's um academy.jazz.org slash ee great and for uh, information on naptown jazz kids you can visit naptownjazzkids.org beautiful 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 so in in all that education you know, there's a question here that i have from from maxim dioman who's a phenomenal drummer in uh, in the ukraine and uh, an excellent player and teacher and educator on, in his own right he said respect of your teacher is most important part of your education do you think this modern time relations of a student and teachers has changed has it changed how you we teach now than how it was when you were younger yeah i mean absolutely it's changed uh, i think i think the way students absorb information is different um, I think students are, are more aware of, of their surroundings musically, of what's happening. Um, you know, in, or, in order for, you know, in order for my generation or, or our generation, Dom, to, to check out a band, you know, you had to buy tickets and go to a live concert. Yeah, yeah. You know, you bought the tickets at the record store. Yeah. Well, there's no record stores anymore, you know. And I'm not saying that, that, that those, were, those times were better than these times. It's just simply different. Yeah. So... You know, I think I think educators like ourselves, because we have a similar pedigree, mm. I think uh, the success that we have is predicated on having a flexible mindset and being able to change and adapt and know what's happening so that we can we can continue to relate to um, to these younger the younger generations as we as we teach. Now, that's not to say that the fundamentals, the pillars of education drum set education aren't important because yeah. i still use stick control i still use advanced techniques for the modern drummer yeah. you know i still use syncopation yeah. you know ted reeb was from my hometown just outside of Wilkesbury. he was from glen lyon yeah. he was a member of the american federation of musicians local 140 which was the same local i was a member of when i was age 11. how beautiful he would speak at the banquets you know i mean so um so has the, has the respect has the respect changed has that changed or has that stayed the same i thought i would say it's changed because there's so many online schools now you know there's and there's so much video content so i think perhaps students um i think sometimes students get the realization in their mind that if they watch a youtube video that they're going to pick it up you know if they watch 
a video um, or maybe something on an online drum school that from watching it once or twice that they're going to pick up the necessary approach or technique. But the missing ingredient is the repetition, mm. right? So, yeah. you know, when, when we when we were studying with Joe or, you know, exercises with Jim, there was a great deal of repetitive endurance type exercises. We yeah. would practice in front of a mirror with yeah. a metronome and we would continue to try to refine our motion because, you know, like in your book, it's your move. You know, you're always going to sound the way you move. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, you know, Peter Erskine once said, if you close your ears and you just watch a drummer play, you could tell whether or not how that's going to sound yeah. based yeah. on how they move, how yeah. effortless poetry in motion. Absolutely. So I think by I think it's good, but I think in some ways it's surface learning when you're watching a video and a student is naive, of course, and they're taking yeah. some are and they'll take away that information and feel like I've got it. Um, you know, you might have it on a surface learning level, but it's important for students to realize that you can't know everything. It's impossible to learn everything. You just want to try to be as flexible as you can in your concept. Learn about the music you love. My first lesson with Morello, for example, he said, Steve, he said, I'm 40 years older than you. The music that you're into, I'm probably not going to be into and vice versa. Yeah. However, what I'm about to show you, trust me, It'll work. trust <laughs> that what I'm showing you is going to help you. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of the students that he had, Danny Gottlieb, yourself, uh, John Riley, John Riley Tim, yeah. Tim Genus, yeah. Lee Howard Stevens, yeah. Lee Howard Stevens, marimba virtuoso, when he was studying at Eastman, he would come down and study snare drum. <laughs> and, he, and he credits his method of movement and his handhold with the four mallets to studying with Joe. I mean, it all connects. And that's that lineage from George Lawrence Stone to Morello to yourself. I mean, that's how this lineage, you know, has continued on. Let me go by, you know, you, you mentioned the, the books that you have. you got four books out that, that I think are fantastic to talk about. With Alfred, Big Band Drumming at First Sight. Talk about that briefly. Right. So that was a book that came out, I think, around 2011, 2012. Do you have the book um, you to show it? I, I have it somewhere. I don't have it right here at the ready, oh, unfortunately. Okay. But but you could find it at my website or on Amazon or at yeah. Alfred's site. But um, it's it's a book uh, that focuses on uh, students that are having difficulty with sight reading. Mm. And so in the book, I you know I talk about listening more and reading less, mm. and how reading albeit is important. If you're playing snare drum or you're playing timpani or marimba or xylophone or vibraphone, yes, you're reading the notation as written. But when you play drum set, it's really more about listening yeah. and interpreting the written notation. Yeah. And drummers, you know, great big band drummers, small group drummers, you see a chart, you, you, you're reading bar to bar, but you're leaving out a lot of, of the written notation and you're adding your own fingerprint, you know, yeah. to the music yeah. and just ways of taking a chart and siphoning, siphoning it down to give a student the confidence to look away yeah. from the chart, because that's really one major issue from talking with band directors over the years that I can't get my drummer's head out of the big band chart. They're, they're, <laughs> their, head, their head is here and I'm trying to have a communication with them and, and work with them and collaborate with them to move the tempo along or slow the tempo down or to change the dynamic. But they're just so focused on the part. It's sort of like a safety blanket. Yeah. And so I just talk about ways of looking away, siphoning down the part so that you're actually reading that thing less right. and listening more so that you have an understanding as to what to play in the moment. So that's, that's kind of the, the predominant thread. Yeah. yeah. So talk about, talk about now the book that you did with Dave Black, who again, phenomenal, you know, percussionist and awareness and editor and, and educator. And he's got all the whole of his books are great. The big band drumming philosophy. What was that yeah. about? So that's a book that centers on fills, drum fills that lead into figures, mm -hmm. ensemble figures and or section figures within a big band context. So both books are, are really big band centric. So I'm just trying to, you know, capitalize on on uh, what 
what folks kind of know me for in terms yeah, of playing well, in a big band. So I figured, well, maybe I can share some of this information. Totally. In print, you know. Totally. So, now, talk about now the, the Mel Bay books that you have. The one is inside the big band drum chart. Talk about that now. What, what's different about that? Well, that has a lot of historical information. Uh, that comes with an MP3 CD or downloadable MP3 files and, and DVD um, or downloadable video MP4 files of, of myself playing the charts full analysis of all these charts, but also um, there's a lot of history and interviews with not only jazz drummers, like I interviewed, extensively interviewed Louis Belson for that book. It was one of his last interviews that he gave. I also interviewed Jake Hanna for that book, the great big band drummer who played with Woody's band in the early 1960s. Yeah. And, and he played with Maynard's band before that. And he and played with, with Mary McPartland before super that. Super sex. Don't forget super sex. Super sex, too, played, right. Played with right. super sex, yeah. Yeah, he did a lot of records on that Concord label. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, and on the Merv Griffin show. So he was just like one of these guys that, and he was hilarious. He was, But he was so giving with his time, so witty and so giving with his time. So he allowed me to interview him and uh, Terry Gibbs and and um, Mark Taylor and just so many uh, so many great musicians, Ed Sof, that, that talked about their experiences playing in big bands. Yeah. You know, in their, in their given the given opportunities they had, whether it was with Woody Herman or Stan Kenton or. Right, right, right. Um, so there's more history with that, with that particular, with that particular book. Peter Erskine did the forward, thankfully. Never studied formally with Peter, but we hung out a lot. He played with the blues on a number of times. And um, just being around him made me a more complete musician. Oh, special guy, real special guy. Uh, yeah, just a wonderful musician, wonderful percussionist, um, very articulate teacher and player yeah. and uh you know really honestly this this record um battle lines that i'm that's coming out on june 26th i started my own music group um so it's more than a record label it, there's going to be educational offerings and and apps down the road uh, that will be um, under the blue canteen music umbrella if people want to check out the new record they can hear a track on, on yeah. blue canteen music it's bluecanteamusic.com. This is your new record coming out June 26th. Yeah, June 26th. It's called Battle Lines. Battle Lines. Let's talk about, about, about what it's about and the music that's on it. Because it's yeah, really, really but, good. You know, the, the whole idea, the whole concept of starting this music group really came from what Peter did in the 90s with Fuzzy Music. And yeah. he still has his label and his music group happening with Fuzzy Music. And I think he got that idea from Stan Kenton from Creative World. You know, so it's just, yeah. you know, it's being inspired by everybody, you know, being yeah. inspired by you, being inspired by everyone that's tuning in, being inspired by my students, being inspired by the musicians that I work with. And um, and so, yeah, so this recording Battle Lines, I started a small group because I wanted to become more adapt at writing tunes. Yeah. And so over the last six years, I've released three records under my own name. Uh, the first one back in 2014 was Heads Up. Uh, 2016 was Allied Forces, and now this year I'm putting putting out uh, Battle Lines, and I try to set goals for each recording. Yeah. Um, you know, the last recording I wrote six original tunes. On this one, I wrote a or I wrote seven original tunes, and then did arrangements of the other four tunes on the record. Yeah. Um, I love recording outside of New York or right in New York proper. Um, there's a certain pace and a certain vibe and energy yeah. that New York brings. Um, I like combining musicians that know my music um, very, very well here in the DC, Baltimore area. So I, I take one or two musicians usually on the session from this area. And then I, I couple it with musicians in New York that really don't know anything about my music. Yeah. And so I, I combine those two and um, there's a certain urgency. Uh, the music isn't perfect. There's warts on the music, but you can hear the effort, um, you know, on the tracks themselves. I also like recording and getting everything done on one day. So we recorded it on January 15th. We tracked 11 tunes in a six hour session. And so it's sort of done like the old, you know, the old Blue Note records. Yeah, the old school days, which, which yeah. produced great music. Absolutely. You know, yeah. So it was more about the music, maybe less about, you know, the technology. I, I recently saw an interview with, uh, I can't remember the, the gentleman, but he, he was saying, you know, I was a pro musician long before Pro Tools. You know? <laughs> and I thought that was a funny line because it's like, you know, back in the day when guys were tracking, you know, you had to really 
be in the moment and, and, and be centered and, and play as a group. The group sound had to be yeah. in order for it to translate on tape. You had to send virgin sounds through that microphone that would print on tape. You couldn't just touch the drum and, 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 and hopefully Pro Tools will work it, you know, or, you know, guys use, using a lot of compression, uh, you know, lots of effects. That just didn't happen, you know, on the records I came up listening to. You know, I like to record with minimal compression. I like to balance the instrument myself. I want to balance the cymbals and the drums and use minimal effects and compression and get a band vibe going. To me, it's more about that listening. I don't like really, I mean, myself, I mean, I don't care listening to listen to myself. I'm not that in love with what I'm doing. Yeah. So I don't, I don't really listen to myself. I'm but listening that... to everyone else, which is informing me as to what to play. And when I, when I look at the instrument through that lens, I tend to, uh, I tend to accept my, my rhythmic uh, offerings on a higher level, I think. I, I can accept it. I'm still not satisfied, but I can accept it as opposed to playing in a silo and saying, okay, my balance is good. This is my jazz beat. Great. I'm going to resolve. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm going to play this four bar phrase like Philly Joe or like Tony or like Elvin, you know, I mean, that's the thing about the teachers like, that we've had, you know, thinking about Joe, it's like, he would always say, why would you want to sound like anybody but yourself? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're you, you're, you're special, man. You have your own God given gifts, man. Develop that. Absolutely. Develop but, that. but that but that's so, the deepest part of, of what you do. But you mentioned something which I thought was very important. And I want everyone to kind of understand. You said playing in the moment and in the now. That really is where all great music lives in that moment. Not thinking of the reading, not thinking of the music, not thinking of anything more than just in that moment, reacting like a true improvisational artist immediately at that moment. Right. Reacting, interacting, initiating. And the stronger your fundamentals are, yeah. then you don't have to worry about it. Like the last thing I'm thinking about is full strokes, half strokes, you know, <laughs> my bass drum string, spring tension. You know, <laughs> my, my, my cymbals. I mean, I'm not thinking about the instrument at all. I'm the instrument. I'm not yeah. thinking about my setup. I, I, I just want to sit down and feel comfortable. And Mapex allows that for me. Like I could sit down on a Mapex instrument. Yeah. And it just, I feel that when I'm playing, I'm not fighting anything. I right. have my, I have these Saturn fives behind me. Yeah, talk about that for a second. Just yeah, talk about the kit for a second about the Mapex. Yeah. I mean, you get, you the, the granite kit. sparkle, granite sparkle, um, uh, Saturn five kit, just a, a fourteen by twenty two, eight by twelve, sixteen by sixteen. Yeah, floor tom and um, you know diplomat heads on yeah. on the tops and bottoms. You know. Very thin heads, very very thin. Very heads. thin heads, you know, yeah. but very responsive. So I could I could play very soft on those heads, but if I, I lean into them, they bark. But I could play really, really soft and not lose any dynamics. And they hold up. The tuning holds up. The shell configuration, that combination of, of uh, the maple shell mixed with, um, with the walnut yeah. gives me the projection that I need, but also the warmth of overtone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and part, so of that, part of that process is that the, the walnut is a, is a, is a, a stronger wood. If it was only maple, they could not make the shell thin. And that's what they are. They're, it's a thin shell, but because of that little layer of walnut in there, it adds strength to the maple sound. That's really the magic of what of what Mapex has done so brilliantly with the Saturn line. Yeah, and there's just so much more. I mean, they're gorgeous drums, but then you also have their bearing edges, the way they cut those bearing yeah. edges. Yeah. And, you know, they're all, they're all drummers. Yeah. I mean, everybody there is a drummer. And so, like, they listen to everyone that's a drummer that has an idea. You know, they're open to having a conversation and they're very passionate like we are about making music, like we are about teaching. Well, they're just as passionate about making and surpassing the quality of every other instrument in the industry. They really have they're forward thinking people. Yeah. And, and so I like being involved with forward, forward thinking people because it makes me better. Just like the musicians on my record. I mean, I try to surround myself with players that play better than me. Because well, I want to learn from them. I want to. Yeah. I want to collaborate with the best. And thankfully, I've had I've had opportunities to do that. You know, I've been playing with Walt Weisskopf's group since retiring from the military in 2017. Recorded with him. 
I've been playing with, you know, Buddy Rich was one of my very first, it was the first jazz Barry and, and um, back in the seventies. And Buddy had this great club in the early seventies uh, called uh, Buddy's Place. Buddy's Place, yeah, fantastic. And well, I'll tell you something, you, you really have opened up an incredible, you know, we, we, we could be talking for a, yeah. another hour if we could, you know. Well, let's do part two, Dom. I, I, I like the way you're thinking. So everyone that joined us, thank you so much. This is great that we, all the several countries that have great, great questions of what we have. As always, we need just more time, but I want to thank Mapex so much for giving us this opportunity. And Steve, thank you so much for giving us your time. And and uh, again, this will be back on Mapex YouTube channel. So yeah. go by and check it out. Steve, thanks so much. Be safe, be well, and we'll do this again for sure. Thank you, Dom. God bless everyone. Stay safe. Thanks so much. Thank you.